We breed them big in uh, in Norfolk, as you can see. Uh, but we do get some hellish holes in skirting boards, but there you go. So uh, we'll just start off uh, just with a, a bit of an introduction. Um, hopefully we will. So that's me, Carl Chapman, and I run a small uh, tour company called Wildlife Tours and Education. Uh, it's been in operation now just over, just over 10 years. So uh, we're just coming up to the point now where, uh, where I'm thinking about uh, how to move it on next, but we'll uh, that's for another day. Uh, I also um, am regional coordinator for Sea Watch Foundation, uh, gathering cetacean records from around Norfolk and pushing those um, back to a uh, central office in Wales and effectively uh, Sea Watch Foundation then goes on to lobby government with regards to various things regarding cetaceans. I'm also a member of British Divers Marine Life Rescue and occasionally get called out to uh, more often than not in Norfolk deal with seals but occasionally it's for uh, it's for uh, cetaceans, uh, porpoise, dolphins, whales and so on. I'm also a county cetacean recorder, uh, so I put together a, uh, all the records for the county uh, and also um, look at people's sightings and uh, help them decide exactly what they've seen and eventually they was going to a report at the end of the year. Uh, I'm also chairman of the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society, um, which is the one of the oldest naturalist societies in the uh, in the country, uh, certainly the oldest in Norfolk, and we've been around for 151 years now. So, um, but I've not been the chairman all that time. Um, effectively, uh, my term of office will come to an end this year, as a matter of fact. Uh, certainly for a while anyway, but I'm still heavily involved in the society or will be heavily involved in the society. But principally, I'm an ornithologist. Um, that's basically where my qualifications lie and uh, what I enjoy most, I must admit. So, um, from Shaw to Heath, if uh, those of you that perhaps live in Norfolk, will instantly recognize the church in the screen there. If you're watching it on a big screen, you'll be able to see that uh, to the left of the main tower, there's a small one, that's Blakeney Church. That small tower was built for the fishermen so they could recognize Blakeney Church when they were out at sea, so they knew where to come home to. So what we're gonna do here is a collection of photos, uh, just with a little chat between the photos, effectively journeying from the sea uh, over the shingle ridge, the marshes, over the marshes, uh, the, the various sort of reed beds that we've got here, uh, up the uh, coastal ridge uh, and up onto the heath. So it's just a, a sort of, um, if you like, I'm going to take you on a tour uh, that I would operate on a daily basis. It's just you're getting the best tours uh, in, in one sort of hour, hour and a quarter, something like that. Okay, so we'll, as Danielle said, we'll take questions at the end. Um, and if we can just sort of uh, start out at sea, really. Um, these are white beak dolphins. Uh, up until the year 2000, they were the most common dolphin that we got off Norfolk. Since the year 2000, the North Sea has been somewhat warming. And uh, because white beak dolphins are a cold water species, they will move or they have moved further north. We've got um, this species coming in to replace them. This is a common dolphin, which are becoming commoner in our waters. It's principally a, a warmer water species. Um, and as you can see in this photograph, you, you're getting the two for the price of one. 
You can recognize it as a common dolphin because of the hourglass symbol on the side. Uh, the guys down in Cornwall that have joined us will, uh, will perhaps be familiar with this species. It's one of the, or the commonest dolphin around Cornwall. Lovely species. But principally, this is the, uh, this is the species of cetacean that we do get off Norfolk, uh, more than anything else. Uh, this is a harbour porpoise. Um, there was a time when it was impossible to look out to sea and not see a harbour porpoise in Norfolk. And that time is not too long ago either. Unfortunately, numbers have now started to decline quite dramatically. And in the Norfolk Burden Mammal Report uh, that came out last year, I did a paper on exactly why. And it just seems to uh, happen that uh, the number of heart, um, uh, gray seals uh, which are increasing quite dramatically um, in the couple of colonies that we've got in Norfolk uh, is coinciding with the decrease in harbour porpoise numbers. There are several reasons that that, uh, that, that might, uh, one might be affecting the other. The first is, is that um, it's a couple of years, a few years ago, there was a, um, a spate of harbour porpoise strandings with unusual cuts on them. They were like spiral cuts that went down the whole the length of the animal. And it just coincided with the, um, with the wind farms that we've got offshore going in place. And the platforms that were uh, putting the um, wind farms in place had ducted propellers. And it was thought that the uh, the harbour porpoise were being sucked in and effectively given, being given these spiral cuts. But in fact, when some Dutch researchers uh, started digging a little bit and taking DNA samples from the corpses that were being washed up on shore, they found out that it was harbour seal, uh, that, that it was grey seals that had taken um, a liking to the taste of harbour porpoise and they'd started ripping the skin off them. And they were able to do that. It's thought that they were able to do that because there were um, harbour porpoise were being caught in nets offshore. Um, they were then easy prey once they were drowned for uh, grey seals to feed on. And grey seals had got a taste for harbour porpoise and were chasing them down. And in fact, it's been documented on film that this has been happening. Uh, this coupled uh, with um, something that's only weeks old in publication is that numbers of harbour porpoise, their um, productivity may be being suppressed by heavy metals in the, uh, in the ocean. So they're, they're having it from all sides at the moment. And seeing a harbour porpoise now is, is quite a, a special event off our coast. Um, we're a long way from what we were 20, 25 years ago when it was almost impossible not to see one. We do, however, uh, from time to time, get one or two larger cetaceans off Norfolk. Uh, this is a uh, humpback whale that's uh, waving at you. This is the underside of the whale. Um, and you can see that um, effectively it's uh, having a good old breach. We've had a returning humpback for several years uh, in Norfolk. I'm saying we've had a returning humpback. It's not positively proved it's the same animal, uh, but it seems to do the, the same actions. It seems to visit the same place at the same time of the year. So it's highly likely that it's, it's the same animal coming back, but obviously it's not guaranteed. What we do have in Norfolk, uh, is plenty of seals and a whole raft of companies that have evolved into an industry in taking people out to see them. These are common seals. Uh, you can see the uh, teddy bear-like nose on them, um, which distinguish them from, from the parallel nostrils of a, uh, of a grey seal. And um, effectively, these are summer breeders. 
So they will come up onto the sand at Blakeney Point where this one was, uh, where this photograph was taken, and they'll um, they'll breed, come in, pup, uh, and then disappear. The pups are born with a dark pelage. Um, unlike these guys, this is a uh, this is a grey seal. Um, this is um, I'm just going to move my screen around a little bit. I'm sorry, this is a, uh, a, another common seal. Uh, we called this one uh, Donald for obvious reasons. Um, it's not a usual color type, uh, but there's an awful lot of um, displacement between here and the Thames and also Holland and ourselves. Uh, so there's an awful lot of sharing of, uh, of animals that move around the coast and across the North Sea. And in the, uh, in the Thames, they've got a lot of iron staining. And that's, um, that's what's caused them to be uh, this orange color. This is a gray seal. They're the predominant species in Norfolk that you'll come across. Our largest carnivore. The pups are born in winter. They're white when they're born. Nice fluffy little things. You see with this one, he's uh, sort of uh, trying to be attentive to, uh, to his mum. The, um, compared with the common seal, the gray seal has this very flat sloping forehead, whereas the common seal will have a muzzle like a dog, as well as the parallel nostrils, not meeting like a teddy bear. I thought I'd pop this one in. It's, um, it's an unusual sort of uh, abnormality that I came across. Uh, and that's a blue eyed gray seal. Never ever seen one. We do occasionally get completely black melanistic gray seals, uh, but uh, blue eyed ones I've only ever seen one. And I don't know anybody else who's seen one either. So exactly what causes it, I don't know. There's no documentation about it. Offshore, uh, we, uh, we get a big passage of uh, these birds, but they can occur all year. This one was photographed off Chroma Pier. And this is a Manx shearwater. Again, you guys down in Cornwall that are with us tonight will uh, we'll see more of these than we do up here. Another common passage migrant is the uh, is the gannet, particularly in autumn through a September peak. Wonderful birds. Anybody who's not been up to um, up to Yorkshire and seen the only uh, mainland gannet colony in England um, is missing out. Uh, these birds uh, are wonderful flyers and they come past you at eye level. And uh, this is another, um, another bird that we get offshore quite commonly here. This is a, a regular common passage migrant um, with a peak in September, although it's recorded in, in all months. This is a great skewer. A friend of mine, Bob, who may even be on actually, um, found a dead one of these on the beach this autumn. And in fact, it's, it came from way, way up in the Arctic. He found it round the corner, or as I call it, round the corner at Walcott. Um, and uh, it was fortunately ringed and he was able to tell uh, from the, the ring when and where it, was, uh, where it was ringed. And it was ringed way, way up in the Arctic. Another bird that we, uh, we get nesting here is the fulmer. Uh, the scarce, scarce breeder, um, but they start occupying the nest sites on the cliffs here around Cromer uh, in February. Uh, they also nest out at Hunstanton, anywhere where there's a cliff, really. Uh, they occur here all months of the year, uh, but the main passage is from June to July, and they will defend their nests quite vociferously. Uh, and they've got uh, this nasty habit 
of uh, if you get too close, uh, they'll throw up on you. And uh, if they do start to uh, to sort of throw back the fish that they've eaten, it's none too pleasant. You don't want to be too near them. This is, uh, this is a red-throated diver that was uh, on one of the small pools uh, just along the road here. Um, it's in winter plumage. It's, uh, it's obviously come ashore. It's maybe tired after a storm. Uh, but offshore, you can tell it's a, um, a red-throated diver. If you look at the bill shape, you can see that there's a slight upturn on the bottom mandible quite distinctive, nice white neck. The eye always encroaches into the white and like black throated diver and a nice checkerback pattern on it, indicating it's a first year bird. Um, we get them here offshore in their hundreds in winter, literally. And uh, we were down at the beach uh, yesterday looking, um, looking out to sea and we must have had, I don't know, a couple of dozen maybe. Uh, red-throated divers, both on the sea fishing uh, and flying past. This this bird, for those of you that know Norfolk, was uh, was on Kelling Quags. This is a, a great northern diver. Uh, again, it's a passage bird in autumn. One or two do linger for the winter. We had one uh, one yesterday that was just off the surf. Uh, much larger bird, goose-sized bird compared with the red-throated diver. And it's got this, uh, as you can see, it's got this dark patch on the neck that encroaches into the white neck, quite distinctive at a distance. And you can also see from this photograph, it's got a red eye. Uh, most divers and greaves have, uh, have red eyes. Um, not sure why, it's not documented why. It's caused by a concentration of beta carotene in the eye, apparently. Um, maybe it helps them see in the dark when they're diving, who knows? There might be something in that old rumor that when your mum told you to eat your carrots to, uh, to help you see in the dark, might be something in it. And uh, because I've been showing you pictures of the sea, nice and, uh, nice and calm, uh, it's not always calm in Norfolk. This is the, how the sea can appear from time to time. One of the things that, um, that we do get here is uh, quite a bit of purple broom rape on the uh, top of the cliffs. Um, those of you that are into your plants will, will know this is a, um, a parasitic plant or a saprophytic plant that lives um, on other plants. Um, and this is a yellow form. Uh, I'd never seen it previously when I photographed this. Uh, and it, but it's now, when I'm going back to the site at Overstrand where it occurs, it's, uh, it is quite regular. The horse plant being yarrow for this particular uh, variety, nice yellow variety. And this is um, greater broom rate. Um, and it's a very, very rare uh, species. Uh, there aren't many places in the UK where it grows. Uh, where it does grow, it doesn't grow uh, in, in big numbers. Uh, the gorse is the horse plant. I was sworn to uh, secrecy as to, uh, as to where, this, where this is. So unfortunately, I can't give you a location for it, but it does occur in Norfolk, it was actually declared extinct in Norfolk in 1986, uh, but a small colony was found in 2007. So back to the birds and why not? Uh, those of you in the know will know that this is a sandwich turn and it's a sand eel that it's carrying. Uh, on Blakeney Point and several other areas like Skullhead Island, there are various turn colonies and sandwich turns are uh, regular there, moving up from West Africa each year. It's the largest of the reoccurring terns that we've got. Common turn with the black, uh, with the black tip to the red bill. And you'll notice uh, on this bird that there's a, um, a trailing dark edge 
to the uh, to the wing, the outer wing on the primaries. Um, and it's possible to distinguish common turn and arctic turn at some distance using that uh, the thickness of that line as a as a marking feature uh, i think when it was taught to me um, effectively it was it was told to me that on a common turn that line is drawn with a b6 pencil uh, but with a arctic turn it was drawn with a h6 pencil and you can see that the bill is all blood red on this bird and the tail streamers are a lot longer. Turns are always that little bit difficult to photograph because they've got dark eyes. And sometimes the, the eye can get lost in the, uh, the dark hood and uh, it looks as though the animal sort of uh, hasn't got an eye, which is not, uh, not always pleasing. Another turn that we get here in a couple of colonies that we've got along the coast is this species, which is little tern. Very easily disturbed. If, um, if you ever go up to um, Northumberland, they've got a breeding colony up there. And uh, the, the terns quite often nest on the beach and get swept out. Uh, their nests get swept away by high tides. Um, what they've started to do in Northumberland is um, when the birds are away from the nest, after they've sort of built the scrape, they move the whole thing lock, stock and barrel with the eggs on top of, of a beer crate um, so that uh, they're above the level of the beach. The nest is above the level of the beach and is, has that little bit more protection against the high tide. But we've got a couple of colonies here. One close to Great Yarmouth and some on Scalt Head, and uh, one or two do nest on, uh, on Blakeney Point, where this was taken. One of our uh, regular winter visitors along the, uh, along the coast is this species. Uh, this is a snow bunting. Uh, I would imagine a lot of you will be uh, familiar with snow bunting, so regular winter visitor here, in, in sometimes quite large numbers. This year, I think the maximum number I've seen is probably about um, maybe a dozen or so, to be honest with you. But my, uh, my range has been quite limited this year, like everybody else. So uh, there may be larger flocks about. In amongst them and associated with them, quite often you'll get this species. This is a Lapland bunting. If you look at the sort of chestnut area between the two wing bars, that's the dead giveaway uh, for, a, for a Lapland bunting. Again, uh, in times past, if you speak to some of the old guys here, they'll tell you that they occurred in Norfolk in quite large numbers, uh, but not so now. Uh, if you're lucky to see maybe three or four uh, along the coast in a small flock. No, I've got them from frozen. Mm. So again, they come down from the north. Uh, a bit like this species, this is a uh, shaw lark, one of the most beautiful larks. A winter visitor again in small numbers, uh, principally to Holcomb of late. Uh, there's, been, uh, there's been a flock that have come down there uh, each year uh, for the past uh, sort of half a dozen years, uh, but in varying numbers. Sometimes it can only be two or three birds. Sometimes it can be up to 40 birds. So it, uh, they do vary considerably in the numbers. I've, I've popped this picture in. It's not a particularly good picture, but uh, it sort of demonstrates something here. These are three oyster catchers that I just sort of, um, on tour, they were, they were sort of just flying past. But they, uh, they're piping in the air. Uh, they're displaying to one another. They're holding their bills pointed down. They can do this in the air or on the ground. Uh, in which case they sort of still put the wings out, um, point the bills down and make the piping noise that we're also sort of familiar with from oyster catchers. But they, uh, they can also do it in the air. One of the most uh, nondescript waders that we've got here uh, is this bird. This is a knot. It's got one of the most undistinguishable sort of plumages 
of, of, of all birds. It's the sort of um, garden warbler of the, the wading world, really. There's just no features on it. Um, this one was in a small pool um, one winter time. I sort of groveled about in the ice and eventually it came towards me. But although they're uh, nondescript, um, its fascination really comes with its numbers. Um, one of the UK's wildlife spectacles is the flight of not at Snettisham. Those of, of you that have not been to Snettisham um, ought to pay to visit at some stage because it really is one of the best wildlife sites uh, in the UK. You need a high tide uh, to push the waders off the sandbars and off the wash um, and it pushes them onto the pools. I think if you get a, a tide of sort of approaching seven metres, six and a half, seven metres, that's when you get uh, these birds in winter, autumn, uh, that come in in big numbers and they all move towards you, fly over you, uh, stood watching them on the seawall and land on the pits behind in big numbers. This is, um, this is one of the most underrated birds. It's an odd photograph to show you this one, but um, effectively I just wanted to show you that it, it can look um, quite spectacular. This, this was an early returning bird, uh, effectively still in partial summer plumage. Um, it's, uh, it's also underrated in its, uh, in its fascination for its movement as well, because they come from the very far tip of Greenland uh, down to West Africa. So it's a long, long distance migrant. Um, but we've got them all year here, um, mostly winter visitors to us. Um, but the summer plumage is, is stunning, it really is. They're very, very vivid. Little bird at the front here is a sandalin. Quite often they go in and out the seals. Um, occasionally they will pick things off the seals as well. Um, but again, from Greenland, high Arctic Europe uh, comes down to winter with us. When, uh, when they are um, in summer plumage, these birds are brick red down the front, wonderful breeders. And occasionally we, uh, we also get sort of full breeding Dunlin as well. And these are, uh, these are lovely birds with their black bellies. This, uh, this was a photograph where I had to lay in the surf to get this one. It was on the beach at Great Yarmouth. But again, we get them uh, wintering here in Norfolk. Another way do we go on the shoreline here in the sort of uh, hinterland fields is, is lapwing or green plover is its old name. And you can see why looking at the back of that photograph, why they were called green plover. You can normally sex them by the length of the headdress in spring. The longer the headdress, the longer the plume on the head, uh, it's more likely to be a male. And uh, if it's, uh, if it's got a broken breastband as well, uh, that's uh, more of a female feature. In amongst the waders, and you can see them here, um, a lot of black-tailed godwit, you can see a second-hand bird from the right is a peregrine. Quite often, say, over Clyde Reserve, you'll, uh, you'll get a peregrine coming in and stirring the waders up. And, uh, picking out a meal from them. And we do get them uh, nesting in Norfolk as well, in several sites, as well as in Norwich. This one is uh, one of the Chroma birds. Um, they nest on the church, as many of you will know. Another recent addition to, uh, to the breeding birds in Norfolk is the Mediterranean gull. When I say recent, last 20 years or so. At one, at one time to see Mediterranean gull in the UK, you had to go down to Cot Point in Kent, the very sort of tour of the, of the country. Um, but from there, they've spread north 
and they're now breeding well into Yorkshire and I believe Northumberland as well now. So uh, yeah, it's one of these uh, widespread breeding birds that we've got now. White wing bird, very, um, very uh, dainty, quite a small, it's a two year gull, takes two years to age, uh, to adult plumage. And this one's in, in full summer plumage. Nice black head, unlike a black headed gull, which has got a brown hood. This has a, a, a proper black head with that droopy red bill and those, uh, that white eye line, a distinctive call that, uh, that has been described as uh, by a few people as, as being like a pantomime dame. Ciao, ciao. Quite easy to pick up. Glaucus gull. Another winter visitor to us. All white wings. And a little bit smaller and more round-headed is the, uh, the Iceland gull. Structural differences, really. Again, winter visitors. I think there are about three Iceland gulls along the North Norfolk coast at the moment. One bird that when you, uh, when you come to Norfolk in winter, you will see along the coastline here is... Uh, dark-bellied Brent goose. Uh, the guys, again, from Cornwall that are on the call tonight, they'll, uh, they'll sort of have uh, more pale-bellied than dark-bellied, I think. There are six races of, uh, of this goose worldwide, uh, and we get four of them here. Uh, but the principal one is uh, dark-bellied. Occasionally we get uh, pale-bellied. You can see that these have got a whiter flank and, of course, a whiter belly as well. And then just occasionally, well, every year, you'll come across uh, one of these in the flock. You can see how it's, uh, although it's got the pale flank of the pale bellied, it's got the dark belly of the dark bellied, and it's also got a very dark back compared with the uh, Brent goose to the right hand side, left hand side of it. And it's got a full neck ring. The neck ring goes all the way underneath the chin. Uh, it's not broken in front like a Brent goose. And this is a dark bellied Brent. Brent goose. The other one that we do get here is the grey bellied. It's only recently been identified in Norfolk. On passage, uh, we got a lot of these things. Wheat here. This bird was uh, resting in my garden. It had, uh, it was working its uh, its way south. Tired migrant on the patio. Well, on the return, harbinger of spring. That's how uh, I like to look at uh, wheat ears. And just occasionally. We get a, a rarer species of wheat here. Uh, this is um, a desert wheat here. In fact, this, uh, this turned up uh, last November, uh, just uh, uh, about five miles along the coast here. Appeared at Salt House. I think it was there for about 10 days. And this is probably the most summered up bird I've seen in autumn. Uh, it, uh, it's a male. And it's a uh, beautiful bird to watch. We do get, uh, we do, um, I mean, Norfolk is famed for its rare birds. And uh, this is, uh, this is one of, about as rare as it gets, really. This is Trumpeter Finch. This uh, occurred uh, in June 2010. Again, on the beach at Clyde, I think originally it was on Blakeney Point. When it was first seen, and then it flew down towards uh, towards Cly, and spent uh, a couple of weeks there. It was the second record for Norfolk. Uh, they colonised uh, southern Spain, um, Iran, Kamchatka, that sort of area. Uh, but I think that in southern Spain, breeding was proven in 1991. I think they're the nearest birds in Spain. And of course, when you get rare birds, you get twitchings. So uh, these guys were watching that bird. 
And a few of them were also watching this bird here, red back shrike. Again, cly, spring bird. We don't get many spring birds now. They're, they're sort of commoner in autumn. But uh, yeah, beautiful birds, red back shrike. We've not had one uh, breed here in Norfolk for quite a few years now, 20 odd years, although they have bred in Suffolk. And it was thought they bred a couple of years ago, but it wasn't proven, I don't think. A uh, closer look at that bird, you can see that they are quite stunning. Wondering if we move to the sort of reed beds, uh, something less rare, reed warbler. Some people uh, find this, uh, the song of this bird, very difficult to separate it from this bird, which is the sedge warbler which occupies a little bit more rankish vegetation in and around reed reds. Uh, but distinguishing them once you see them is quite easy. This bird has a supercilium above the eye, as you can see, whereas the reed warbler doesn't. A bird, uh, a similar sort of warbler, uh, occupying the same sort of area is, uh, is this guy. This is a grasshopper warbler singing away more often nocturnally singing uh, than uh, diurnally. So they don't often sing in the day. But uh, once they've just arrived, if you give them about a day, they will sing in the daytime before they settle into a nighttime uh, routine of, uh, of singing. Reeling, actually. That's the, uh, the term that's used for their song because it sounds, the song sounds like a, uh, an insect, or more often than not, like the clicking of a fishing reel uh, as it's being wound in. And of course, uh, we do get um, in and around the reed beds, particularly on the uh, on the uh, east coast. We get uh, our speciality, which is the uh, Norfolk hawker dragonfly. Some people want to uh, call it the green-eyed hawker. And you can see from this uh, photograph um, how it gets its name. And in fact, it's um, the, uh, or how it gets its Latin name. If you look at that triangle, that yellow triangle on the thorax there, uh, its Latin name being uh, Achina isosceles. So that's the um, that's the triangle on there. This is a um, small red-eyed damselfly. It's a new kid in the block. First records in 1999. This was taken on the garden pond. Once they tend to get here, dragonflies uh, tend to colonize pretty quickly. Similarly with the uh, willow emerald, uh, 2009 were the first records of willow emerald damselflies moving up from the continent. You can, uh, you can tell it's a willow emerald. If you look at the thorax, the thick end of the thorax there, you can see like a little green spur, a dark green spur poking out into the, uh, the lighter green area. Diagnostic of a willow emerald. And where you get dragonflies and damselflies, you'll always get these guys. This is a hobby. They love to feed on dragonflies. What they do is they'll catch them in their talons, fly them down with their talons, and then they'll reach up to their bill. They'll nip off the wings and then eat the rest of it on the wing. Quite, uh, quite often you'll be, able to, uh, you'll be able to sort of see the glistening wings fall away from the bird in the air. This bird was taken at Holcomb, breeds in the pines there. Another raptor that we get, uh, we get quite a lot of here is the uh, marsh area. This bird uh, came into the, my former garden where I used to live. It's a female bird, you can tell with the, uh, with the sort of cream head. It's a young one as well, young bird. 
And of course, we couldn't mention, uh, couldn't mention, or not mention Barnell. Typical evening flight, hunting the marshes here. Sometimes it's difficult not to see them, and sometimes I can't find one for love and the money. I pop this picture in just to uh, just to sort of uh, have a bit of discussion about it. It's not on the British list. It's a black swan, Cygnus australis. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the uh, one of the birds that's been kicking about Cly for a little while. I think it should be on the British list. Seems to have a um, a sustainable population there, bred in Norfolk. And there are phenomenal numbers in Holland. If you go to Holland, these, uh, these are all over the place. And along the waterways and, uh, and ditches, quite often get these guys now. They're on every water track in, uh, in Norfolk. That's the otters. This one's got a nice fish. And this one had an even bigger fish. This one caught a pike. As I was watching it, I was in South Norfolk actually, but don't often see uh, see these guys about anymore. These are uh, mink, I, more or less gone. Don't see many of them, and I'm out a lot, obviously, um, but certainly along the coastline, uh, I've not seen one now for about maybe. If, six years seven years something like that and of course uh norfolk is quite famed for its uh its cranes they're now in the west and east of norfolk i would guess a conservative estimate of the number of birds in the country is somewhere between 70 and 100 now that's in the country uh sorry in the county uh it'll certainly be more than that in the country there are now breeding populations down on the Somerset levels, uh, there's some in Yorkshire, and there's some in Scotland as well, as well as East and West Norfolk. All probably originating, or well, the majority originating, um, from initially a few birds that arrived in Norfolk at Horsey. Some big reed beds at Horsey that they love. And this bird loves reed beds too, bitten. A couple of years ago, we had 25 booming males in the county. So still not uh, overly common. I sat in the hide and this, uh, this bird just flew past. And it demonstrates why these things became so rare in the first place. If you look at the drumsticks on that, I am told they are very, very good eating. And I'd ask you all a question here that you can perhaps answer at the end. How long is it since you've seen one of these? This is a ruddy duck, famously culled. This was the year before last. That was the last one that I saw. It was at Cly. Bobbed him for a day or two and then disappeared. Don't know what happened to him. There's a walk at Cly down from uh, from the road to the sea along east bank it's the eastern boundary of the uh, the marshes at cly and there are more rare birds reputedly seen from east bank than anywhere else in the uk and uh, this was one of them this was a spotted creek quite a scarce breeder now i believe it does breed on the solway there was a calling bird in norfolk um, two years ago now, but it wasn't proven to have bred. But it has bred in the past, of course. Beautiful little cray, much smaller than a water there. And if you go into Cly Church, you'll see um, uh, in one of the church windows at the foot of Francis, Francis of Assisi, in one of the windows, you'll see this bird. This is a blue throat. 
And that, I guess, when you start putting blue throats in stained glass windows in your church, it's perhaps testament to how common they were at one point in the Clyde area. Not so now, but we still get them through on occasion. Beautiful little birds. Near Clyde Church uh, in 2008, one of these little things turned up. This is a white crown sparrow from North America. It was at the vicarage. Initially, it was seen in the, uh, in the back garden um, by the, the clergy there. Uh, they reported it and uh, the local bird watchers moved the bird table and all the seed slowly around to the front garden so that the birds came with it, if you like, over a few days, uh, so that they could then release the news and let everybody see this bird. Um, very rare visitor from, from North America. And um, people that went to see it threw a pound in a bucket and contributed to, um, to this, which was uh, in one of the new church windows that the funds uh, effectively um, were used for so they put a little white crowned sparrow um, in the window as a thank you I heard um, I went to Canada a few years ago and, and they, uh, they even knew about this church window and the white crowned sparrow over there they were telling me if I knew about it I said yeah um, the clients that I take out on, on their wish list uh, quite often uh, swallowtail butterflies. Uh, they do occur. This is the caterpillar, not a small jobby. They are quite large, or they do grow quite large. And they've got um, quite a um, sort of distinctive uh, disturbance attitude that they take, whereby they'll, uh, they'll put a couple of horns out, orange horns, if, they, if you prod them. It's, um, meant to look like a snake's tongue, apparently, so to scare the bird off. And this is what it looks like when it hatches. And they are a truly beautiful, uh, beautiful bird, a beautiful butterfly. And if you, um, if you look around the reed beds in, in Norfolk, it's quite difficult now not to see these things. This is a uh, uh, Chinese water deer. They escaped originally uh, from Whips and Aids Zoo in 1929. They're about, they're, if you've never seen one, they're about 50 centimetres high. Um, we've now got around about 10% of the world's population in the UK. So we are quite an important uh, reservoir of the gene pool, if you like. Sort of wet habitat really suits it. Really suits this bird too. A bearded tit. Or bearded reedling, call it what you want. Numbers plummet in bad winters as the seed heads that they feed on freeze up, they can't get to them. For some reason, uh, if you go to somewhere like uh, Leighton Moss in Lancashire, they'll, they'll feed these birds grit. Uh, but we, for some reason, don't seem to do that down here. I don't know why. Uh, the north of the UK, it's quite common. Little egret among sea lavender. Quite common now. I remember in the uh, mid or early 1990s running to, <laughs> to see my first one of these things. But they're now breeding in much numbers. And I heard uh, a couple of you talking about spoonbill in the introduction. Yes, they uh, spoonbills breed here now. Or returning, or the return of a spoonbill. And it's been proven that we get a lot of Dutch birds that come over to Norfolk uh, each spring. They've gone in with the uh, little egrets to nest in two places now. And also we're getting these guys. This is a great white egret with the yellow bill and dark feet. And the new breeding bird, um, is this guy, this is a cattle egret, 
So, you know, what, what's going to be next as the temperature gradient moves north with global warming? We're getting all these breeding herons, uh, perhaps purple heron next, squacko heron, glossy ibis maybe, little bit. Another cattle you've got here. With Norfolk white cattle. Hopefully, um, we won't we won't start to get these. These are uh, these have been reintroduced from Africa into or introduced from Africa into France. Um, at the north end of the Bay of Biscay, these are sacred ibis, and occasionally we get these uh, these guys coming up here, presumably from there. Um, but they're very destructive birds. Um, they can sort of run through a turn colony and pick the eggs out and the chicks and completely devastate uh, a colony, just one bird. So it's, it's not something I look forward to seeing, but uh, it's still a nice bird, it's still a nice bird. Something much more benign is uh, kingfisher. Um, to get good views of these, it's uh, some of the sort of uh, rebed pools around the coast. Uh, you've just got to wait your time and you'll eventually see one. This one's a male with no red on the lower mandible, so no lipstick. The female's got lipstick, if you like. And we have a few grey crested grebes, not many on the coast. Um, you've got to go to maybe Holcomb Park or um, down to Snettisham Pools, or better still onto the broads to see these. These were just in the middle of the display. Much more common for these things in the ditches and dikes, particularly around Cly, waterfalls, and yes, they can climb. Um, quite often they'll uh, they'll climb up uh, out of the water. And back to birds again, as we get sort of um, into the bushes further up away from the reed beds, then we're looking at uh, this quite common migrant now, uh, particularly in autumn, don't get many in spring, a uh, common autumn passage bird, and that's a yellow-browed warbler coming in from, uh, coming in from sort of northern Russia each year, increasingly common as the breeding area moves closer to us. And um, Bird watchers quite often call this a, a six stripe sprite. So in other words, it's got the two wing bars on either side and then the two superciliums, one on either side. So it's six stripes. Um, associated species is this bird, which is a palace's warbler, uh, which has uh, the two wing bars on either side, the two superciliums, and it has a central head stripe that you can just see on this bird. Plus it has that, Beautiful lemon yellow rump. But it's not as beautiful as, uh, as this bird, the firecrest, which I'm sure many of you have seen. On the coastal ridge, it's uh, not a common breeding bird, but it's not too difficult to find. Something that has been a little bit more difficult to find this winter is the, uh, the waxwings. Eruptive, of course, uh, on the failure of the Scandinavian berry crops. Uh, they'll find their way further south to come and visit us uh, to feed on our berries. But there haven't been many this year. And something that's, uh, that's even rare, I've been lucky enough to see a couple in Norfolk, are these butterflies. Um, the Americans call them uh, morning cloak. Um, they've got a sort of very, very similar butterfly in North America, but we call them Camberwell beauties. Uh, they don't breed in the UK anymore. I'd be happy to be corrected on that, but I don't think they do. Uh, but these guys come down, uh, come over from the continent occasionally. Uh, that one was uh, Teachwell, in the car park at Teachwell. If, uh, if you go for a, a walk um, 
in the dunes at uh, in the sort of late summer you can see these these are creeping ladies tresses beautiful tiny orchids some years you struggle to find spikes some years you can find hundreds and we do have a couple of sites where it's easy to find these and these are an associated species these are autumn ladies tresses very few plants in norfolk now although uh, there is a quite a large colony in a waterworks just uh, the other side of the county boundary just outside king's Lynn. okay so um, let's move about the county a little bit let's go back to cromer cromer church here and if you can uh, if you can sort of see the two main windows there and you find the line on the bottom of the window and then move out to the right of it, you can see a little speck in the air there. That's this bird. It's an alpine swift, a regular spring visitor. And uh, I used it as the logo for my business because as I was setting the business up, I was hanging the washing out one morning and one flew over me at high speed. Invariably, they tend to end up at. Um, Beast and Bump um, or Cromer Church, the high points they're looking for, uh, obviously. Something that's becoming almost as rare is that in Norfolk is this bird. I no, don't know of any breeding nightingales in North Norfolk now. You've got to go to South Norfolk to the county boundary. Um, still get plenty on passage. But this was uh, one of the last breeding birds that I photographed a couple of years ago. I guess there's less uh, suitable habitat now. And uh, if there is a conservation issue that needs attention in Norfolk, this is it. Something that we do get quite a lot of in Norfolk as a regular winter visitor. And uh, this guy was photographed in uh, a back garden a few years back. There's a red one. But unfortunately, as I was watching it, it wasn't there for long. This sparrowhawk, this small sparrowhawk came down and uh, gradually took it apart. So as we get uh, up onto the ridge away from the sea, uh, around places like uh, Holt Country Park, um, one of the things you might see uh, crossbills. This was clinging to uh, was clinging to uh, the side of a tree, as I photographed. It. And uh, the the sort of coastal ridge is a glacial feature that runs east west along the North Norfolk coast. And uh, it adds a little bit of height once you about a kilometer inland from the coastline. And it's used by raptors to, um, to move along, to migrate along. And uh, one of the raptors that you can get is, uh, is this guy. This is Honey Buzzard. This flew over the garden, actually, uh, when I lived in uh, North Reps. Tend not to see them in land uh, right at the coast where I am now. Uh, but the, uh, they're still seen regularly, but not commonly, moving along the, uh, the ridge at the back of me. So beyond the coastal ridge, you're into the farmland. Um, got really good populations of brown hares in Norfolk. Uh, Norfolk used to host the National Hare Coursing Championship, so, which is obviously no longer taking place, but we still get... Uh, we still get uh, plenty of hairs, no doubt about that. And fallow deer. Still scarce outside the parks that we've got outside the deer parks, got a few deer parks in Norfolk. Um, but raw deer are not uncommon. It's a nice little book that was just, uh, just on the edge of some dunes before we got into the farmland actually. 
and we've still got uh, several herds of, uh, of red deer in Norfolk. Particularly in the broads around the Hickling area. And once you get to the other side of Cromer to where I am now, back up to North Rips, there's still a herd up there as well, but uh, you don't often see those. A bird of the, the farmland is this guy, Grey Partridge. Surprising how many people that come out with me that want to see Grey Partridge. They've seen plenty of Red Partridge. Um, I suppose it's a sort of quintessential part of British countryside, really, Grey Partridge, English Partridge, as it's sometimes called. And another sort of uh, part of the British countryside that we don't often see are these birds. This is a turtle dove. But numbers, as you uh, as you know, are now tumbling. Just uh, talking about sort of North Reps and where I used to live, I was having my breakfast in the uh, in the dining room, and uh, this thing landed in the garden. It's great, great shrike. And numbers of these are also tumbling as well. Not as common a winter visitor as it once was. Still nice to see when you're having your breakfast, though. But a bird that is on the increase are these guys, red kites. There's now a minimum of 34 breeding pairs, and there'll be plenty that aren't breeding as well. So there'll be a top side of a 125, 130, I would have thought, in Norfolk now. Certainly the winter roost last winter was uh, on the 70 plus bird side. So um, yeah, they're doing pretty well. Uh, something that, uh, that I've come across increasingly, so this last summer were uh, slow worms. Nice round pupils. So easy to distinguish, not really a, a worm or a snake. It's a legless lizard, but we still see, uh, still see quite a few of these on the tour. And also adders as well. I've only ever seen the, uh, the males do a, a dance where they sort of beat one another down. I've only ever seen that once. And luckily I had my camera with me. So you can see that they were dancing together for the attention of a female. And once we get up onto the heaths, you've got the uh, one or two odd butterflies, uh, silver studded blue butterfly. And the more usual view that you get is this, where you can see the uh, blue studs to the rear of the hind wing there. And one of the things that we have got still in Norfolk, they're hanging on, is uh, these birds, this Dartford warbler. We've got a tenuous hold. Uh, these are possibly the world's most northerly breed in Dartford warblers. Still have a couple of pairs. Beautiful wine red on the underside and that uh, lovely eye, very scratchy call when you hear them. Reminiscent of a, a sort of um, more in tune white throat. And as dirt ends tonight, it's uh, still not too difficult to find uh, a heath with uh, churring night jars. This one was taken at Salt House Heath as it flew past us. And uh, I'm doing regular visits up to the heat uh, each year to see those. We've managed a couple of visits this year. I managed to see them perched up churring. So I was, uh, again, if you've never heard a churring night jar, it's, uh, it's quite eerie, something to behold. It really is. Beautiful birds. So that's where I thought I'd, uh, I'd sort of finish. Um, so I can say to you, uh, have you got any questions?
I see that uh, somebody's sent some questions in. Fantastic, Carl. Thank you. I thought that no, was okay. incredibly interesting. I'm glad I was on mute because I um, kept making squeaking noises at all the cute photos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for Ten melanistic pups ones. upon the point this winter. Uh, yeah, from Carl Brooker. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. Could, could I ask you, Carl? Yes. Um, when you got to the Heath, I expected you to be showing us some storm curlew. Mm -hmm. You've still, still got them breeding in Norfolk, haven't you? Still got them breeding in Norfolk, yeah. <clears throat> they, they, um, there are a few places dotted along the ridge uh, where they do breed, but to be honest with you, the, the core of the breeding area is down in the, uh, down in the Brex, uh, which is the, the sort of area to the, to the south. They do breed on the coast, but there aren't many birds up there. Right, right. Thank you. So this is Andrew Illin. Uh, blue eye is a dark center, maybe scar tissue with melanin pigment deposit. Common in dogs, this is the, the seal, I presume. Common in dogs with chronic keratitis. Didn't know that, that's good. National Trust move little turns on the point too. Do they really? I very rarely go up and see the, um, the little turns other than from boats on the point. I don't walk it up in there. Uh, in summer, I like to do the autumn walk uh, to see any uh, any migrants that are uh, are coming in or are visited. But I don't I don't sort of go out to the point in uh, in summer, so I, I wouldn't have known that. So that's good to know. Any other questions at all? Complete silence. Uh -huh. I'll just have a quiet drink then while I wait. Uh, with my with my love chroma mug. <laughs> there you go. Carl, how many species, different species of cetacean are there around the Norfolk coast? That's debatable. I'm just writing a book at the moment. In fact, I'm just in the middle of um, doing all the referencing, so I'm sort of winding it up really. Um, regularly, you're looking at two or three. Uh, in total, probably you're looking at around about 20, 21, something like that. Um, but some of the older records where you're relying on um, newspaper reports um, or sort of very um, undetailed reports of um, young naturalists and so on or early naturalists it's not it's not often that sort of predetermined that you can say yes it is or no it's not this particular species and to to add to that the names changed you know what they called something um or what they call something now compared with what they called it sort of 150 years ago it sometimes bear no, bears no resemblance um, quite often you'll get something called a grampus, for instance. Now, a grampus was a term used by fishermen for um, any small whale or large dolphin, really. Um, but that name got encapsulated uh, into Risso's dolphin, into the Latin name uh, for a Risso's dolphin, grampus, grampus, chrysalis. And it's, it's something that effectively... Um, just complicated things. The Latin names changed. Uh, some were reused in other species. So where you get um, where you get a nice report that Southwell um, was a, a naturalist of the time. He was a actually a, a bank clerk uh, that worked in Fakenham, and uh, he sort of did a lot with the uh, Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society, and he. He wrote quite a number of books on uh, seals and cetaceans of the British Isles and so on. And he built up quite a bit of knowledge. Uh, and he's deposited an awful lot of material in Norwich Castle Museum. Um, and I've been, over the last sort of uh, four or five years, I've been trying to decipher his handwriting and pull all the details out for cetaceans in, uh, in those books and notes. Uh, and there's been quite some re revelations. For instance, 
um, you're looking at uh, a few years ago, it was thought that uh, orca had never occurred in Norfolk. Well, in fact, it has. It's, it's occurred about maybe uh, 12 or 13 times. Uh, and there are well-documented uh, pieces of information. But when you fit them all together, um, undoubtedly mean that they are um, orcas. And, and, you know, one of the classic examples is a, you've got me talking about cetaceans now, I'm not going to stop. Um, so if effectively they, uh, they'd, um, to give you one example, the guy, uh, a guy called Patterson walks down onto uh, the quay in Great Yarmouth, uh, 1893, and he sees what he calls a grampus, a young grampus. And it's only a couple of a few meters long, this thing. So um, effectively, it was thought that that, that would have been a um, Rissos dolphin because it was called a, a grampy, called it a grampus. But in fact, it wasn't. It was, uh, it was a, um, an orca. Um, he didn't buy it. The fisherman offered it him for sale and he didn't buy it. Uh, and a bit like a sort of woman buying a dress, you know, he, he, he sort of, he walked away from it and regretted not buying it. He went back the following day and they weren't there. Um, but he, he went into, uh, went down the same spot a week later and they got another one, almost exactly. And in his words, in his notes, uh, he spoke almost to a pea in a pod, really, that it was exactly the same. Um, but it was a, a fresher animal. So he bought that one straight away and he uh, put it on a horse and cart, took it down to Norwich Museum and they didn't want it uh, because the skin was abraded on it. So uh, he then took it to, he, he telegrammed uh, a guy called Hamer at uh, Cambridge Museum and um, he basically said, yeah, bring it down here, we'll have it. Um, so he flensed it, the guy flensed it, put it in the collection. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was the first person to look at it for, for over 100 years. Uh, and it was still in, still in there. It was an orca. It was a young orca. Uh, so maybe the, the adult, the female, had had a couple uh, out in the North Sea somewhere and they were brought in by the fishermen. Um, who knows? Who knows? But... Uh, yeah, there's there's certainly orca on the on the Norfolk list now. I've got a couple of messages here. Um, da -da 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 -da. Thanks from Beth Como. You're welcome. Top tips for new photographers trying to get into wildlife photography of mammals, for example. Um, you know. I don't, um, what I don't do is I don't sit and wait for stuff. Uh, what I won't do is is sit in a, um, um, a sort of cloth hide that I've built or whatever and stake something out. It's not my type of photography. What I do is, is I'll take a, a photograph when an opportunity presents itself. And it's about having uh, the camera ready uh, it's about having the settings on the camera ready for something that just crops up. It's not something I, I sort of pursue. Uh, it will happen to me rather than me looking for, for things to photograph. Um, but you've got to be in the right place at the right time, I guess. So it's, that's just the way that I work. Um, shaving the nightingale at county level, habitat. It's always habitat. Uh, we need a little bit more underscrub. Things like muntjac uh, are quite destructive uh, animals. They'll eat the understory out on a woodland, and, and that takes the opportunity for birds like nightingale uh, to nest. It takes it away. So um, the, the uh, water deer, the Chinese water deer, are quite benign. They don't uh, seem to do much damage. Uh, but the muntjacs do. They, they'll eat the understory out of a wood before you've got a chance to do anything. Um, we're trying to arrange um, a visit uh, to Eddie Anderson's wood. Um, he lives sort of the other side of North Reps. 
and uh, he's got quite a large wood there and he's keeping the muntjac out and it's surprising what he's getting nested in there. So it's something that, uh, that hopefully we will get back at some stage. Do I see a population in Norfolk that will draw more regular visits from Orca? I wish. Do you think it's likely that the growing seal population of Norfolk will draw more regular visits from Orca? I wish, yes. Um, in time, well, they've got to find it. They've got to discover it, first of all, before they get down here. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, hopefully they will arrive in time. Once they find out about it, they'll not be able to leave their, uh, their jaws off them, no doubt. We'll see. Anything else? No. I think I saw Rob Holliday talking, but perhaps on mute. Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, no, that's a no. <laughs> no, right. okay. Yeah. He was just ordering his cup of tea. That's all it was, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, thanks ever so much for turning uh, tuning in. Really appreciate it. I'll hand back to Danielle now to close things off. Perfect. Thank you, Carl. Um, I thought that was absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, you can see from all the different comments in the section, amazing, amazing images, great presentation. People really enjoyed watching it. And I, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed the, um, the humorous the, the humorous additions as well. Um, we were chuckling on this end for a few things. So thank you ever so much. Um, and thank you all for joining in. It's over 50 people joined in the end. Um, so that's fantastic. We'll get this uploaded to the website as soon as possible. And, and yeah, thank you ever so much. Have a great evening. See you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.